sponsored by Squarespace. 18 days, that is how long Cloud Imperium Games demanded their staff crunch to create a pristine demo of Squadron 42. Now, Squadron 42 is the episodic single-player game, basically a AAA game based in the Star Citizen universe, made using all the Star Citizen tech. It's got full FPS, EVA stuff, you can walk around the big capital ships, and it has proper cinematic ambitions, which means big actors. You've got Mark Hamill, Gillian Anderson, Mark Strong, Andy Serkis, Liam Cunningham, John Reese davies big names, and a level of production value and attention to detail that befits all of that. Now, of course, there were crashes. Not all was well. And when we examine the overall story, one thing's clear. Chris Roberts, the man in charge, has got the many traits of a typical visionary. Now, it's a vision that I even backed a decade ago. It's his dream game. It's also kind of my dream game. That's why I backed it. But the pathway to here has been bumpy. Deadlines have been missed. Monetization has got very controversial. And right now, it looks like their yearly earnings have somewhat plateaued. We actually know that Cloud Imperium Games' is burn rate, that's how much money they spend every month, we know it's massive. And with this all being timed for CitizenCon, it seems that they needed a win, something to instill confidence and to bring in fresh blood. Fresh blood, of course, at the cost of 18 days of back-to-back -back crunch, which has a tinge of desperation, but to get a demo to get a 90-minute YouTube video so good that people would have to pay attention. I can't deny how impressive that demo is. We see sprawling capital ships you can explore, first-person combat, battles that feel intense. And I do say this stuff as a backer from back in the day. I've regularly played the Persistent Universe. I've done the space battles. I've done the FPS. But seeing it all brought together with this level of production value and the framing of a single-player story is quite incredible. It's compelling. Between the world building, the capital ship exploration, the massive space battle finale, you can can see the ambition that's here, and you can contrast that with some of Roberts's most early work, the Wing Commander franchise. And the funny thing is, you see the ambition is essentially the same thing. What's changed is tools, technology, and production value. Now, all of this arrives a year after being declared feature complete. And I know a lot of people will read that and think, well, that's obviously a lie. It couldn't be feature complete. Well, there could be some features that aren't, but actually, one of the biggest problems with AAA is that polish and bug fixes are treated as the last stretch, as an afterthought. But in reality, they are what make a game a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. If you're wondering where the next Hollow Knight is, yeah, it's because they take this part seriously. So I don't deny that they've been working. I expect that they have been. But that, of course, doesn't help their problem with trust. Now, Chris Roberts himself took the stage, of course, after the crashes. He joked about how the demo gods brought their wrath before dropping the date. 2026. Another two years minimum, which, hey, to me that's fine, I'm happy to wait for a good game. But he did say he did assure people that Squadron 42 has been more stable these last few weeks. Those are rather pivotal few weeks. A pivotal few weeks in which a lot of people reached out to the press, and that means we've got plenty to talk about. October 1st, 2024, a company-wide memo drops, and the requirements are rather staggering. Number one, a little bit less crazy, is that staff must be in office Friday, October 4th and 11th. Those are typically work-from-home days. Where things change, though, is Saturdays, October 5th and 12th, are now mandatory office work days. Yes, a six-day work week, that's a little bit more spicy. Where things change, though, is Sundays. They also became work days. October 6th and 13th would be mandatory work days for the team, but staff were only encouraged to take those days in the office. They could work from home. It's just as it was in Genesis. And on the seventh day, God was really far behind schedule, but ordered himself a cheeky Nando's to his home office. Now, in that original memo, staff were told they would get the time back later. They were told that there would be breakfast and lunch provided, but where it gets a little bit more interesting is that 11 minutes after journalists contacted Cloud Imperium Games about this, asking a few questions, staff suddenly found out that they were also getting a paid holiday scheduled after CitizenCon. Almost as if, from a managerial perspective, they uh, kind of clocked on to just how bad this looks. And in situations like this, it's worth thinking, is this malice or is this 
a management problem, a time management, a schedule problem. You see, everybody knows that extreme crunch like this is borrowing money from tomorrow, but at a ludicrous interest rate. You burn people out. So when it does happen anyway, we can deduce that the people who made the call did not feel that they had any more option. To them, it wasn't just bugs worth fixing because that would be nice for the demo. No, you only make a large controversial call like this that will tank morale at your company if you really feel like you need to make it. And based on some things we've learned about the state of the company, that does kind of make sense. And look at the worst of times, we've all been through cycles of work a bit like that. They suck and you can avoid them with a good solution like today's sponsor. Who let you get from idea to done fast and with no bugs, they're Squarespace. And whenever I needed a job site and a game landing page, I went to them because Squarespace makes getting the job done simple, fast and cross device all looking fantastic, especially with their new Blueprint AI. It essentially guides you through making your own custom Squarespace template. They make sure that your different fonts are all paired correctly, that your colors are nice and harmonious, which means you don't have to be a designer to actually have a stunning looking site. Then you can customize all the details with their block based editor that makes everything simple. And if you want real granular fine control, Fluid Engine lets you do just that, but without introducing bugs and making your site not work on mobile. It's quite amazing. And this stuff matters because a good first impression seriously helps on the web, be that just hosting your portfolio, your personal site, or of course, if you're doing business where they've got you covered. E-commerce for digital products, for physical products, they'll hook up with your shipping provider. They support courses if you're selling educational products, bookings, maybe you're doing in person or online. They have all of that and wrapped up with Squarespace payments to make it even simpler for you and to give your customers more options. They handle all the fiddly stuff so you can focus on what makes your your offering to the world unique. You can go to squarespace.com slash news to build your site with a free trial, which you should do anyway, because it's just fun to make something. And then you can send it live with 10% off your first purchase of a site or domain using code BALLYLERNEWS. A fresh report recently dropped from Insider Gaming, and it reveals a darker context to this stuff. 100 to 150 staff gone in February 2024, primarily from their Austin and LA offices. Now, according to their sources, the severance packages that people were offered came with strings. You had to sign an NDA. If you don't sign the NDA, you do not get your severance package. And I suppose if you're wondering why we didn't really get that much information at the time, well, that would probably be why. You must ask yourself, why would they do that NDA? And specifically, why would they do it in their situation? They're not a regular AAA publisher where everybody just expects bad things will happen. They're a community-backed game, a ludicrously community-backed game. So any bad stories that employees do choose to share with that community, well, those will feel like a personal betrayal. And it is that use of backers' money that makes other things a little more curious. Enter Manchester, nice old city, but it's got Cloud Imperium Games is big new office, and it's a monument to success. As a science fiction fan, holy shit, please. A custom paneling, the massive statues, custom cafe, no mere canteen, a cafe with baristas. One staff member sarcastically said to Insider Gaming, but at least we have baristas serving us coffee here. Lovely. Now, usually this kind of office decoration is fine. You know, it sets a tone, it builds a culture, it's impressive. Valve's office has a valve in it perhaps even the Valve. There's the Luden statue in Kojima's office and countless others, but there's a core difference. Very often those studios are using their own money that they've generated from products that they've sold. And that is different to backing something either on Kickstarter or directly. Now, of course, the argument that a good inspiring office is going to be good for your team holds water. That does make sense. You want to give your people quality food. If the office coffee isn't total shite, that's great. But it's a question of balance and value, even though this is Cloud Imperium Games' money. That's the thing, it is their money. To backers, it's a pledge, but to them, it's general revenue. And this opens them up to a new criticism where the community will look at every custom wall panel or extremely cool sci-fi looking door and think, why is that not going into the game? This feels like a betrayal. I'm obviously not saying that we need to lock the developers in a bare hangar with no heating. Backer money invested in good working conditions will see return on investment. The problem here is luxury excess, and that is what's rubbing backers and staff the wrong way, especially when that is being built during a hiring freeze amid layoffs. Generally speaking, most companies are set up to not allow this sort of thing to happen. There are chains of accountability, a chain of command, a board who can fire you if you make a big, big mistake. Here though, 
And there's Chris Roberts, whose name drew in millions of crowdfunding 12 years ago, and his name certainly helped to draw me in. As an example, Freelancer, one of the last games he worked on before he did a stint in the film industry, well, it's rough around the edges, but it's got a special place in my heart. And there's another factor you will not know about unless you were there at the time. 2012 was a different gaming industry. Now, it was the gaming industry. Yes, we were angry at things. We were thinking about what EA did to Mass Effect 3, why they mandated it to be shut out in basically two years, slightly under. Every game came with a pre-installed grey, brown, yellow piss filter that made them all look the same and bad, and PCs were genuinely struggling against consoles, and we were lucky to even get a decent port. It was the perfect time for Star Citizen's message of a true, ambitious vision that was entirely pro-PC gaming. But of course, with visions come visionaries, and they can be interesting to work with and interesting to manage projects. Staff paint quite the picture. Here's a quote. I've genuinely been sat in meetings that got derailed for 30 minutes so that the placement of objects that players are likely never to interact with could be discussed in detail. There's just no actual focus on getting the game done. Attention to detail cuts both ways. Iteration is normally a good thing normally. A source said this to Insider Gaming, Sometimes the most basic features can be reviewed by him half a dozen times for it then to be scrapped or changed on the seventh review. The staff detail deep problems. A custom game engine described as a Frankenstein, a sort of constantly mutating thing full of custom solution after custom solution, which means that if you're an experienced staff member, you're holding the whole thing together. If you're new, it's really hard to get started. And the problem, the impression is that experienced staff cannot make a proper impact at the company so they just leave. Newer staff then join, but because they're newer, they cannot recognize problems soon enough, and they end up in a strange position where they've been there for a while, they think they're still going to ship a game, it's not went how they wanted, but they also can't afford to have so much of their career, of their CV, spent at a company without shipping a game. To quote directly from Insider Gaming, it's created an unhealthy place to work. You can't push back on anything, one current developer admitted. They are repeating mistakes that other companies made 20 years ago, which contributes to the shortcomings of their ambitious features. It absolutely stands to reason. It absolutely makes sense. And some of that makes sense because Chris Roberts left the industry after he left Digital Anvil and wasn't involved in Freelancer. He was producing movies. He then came back to the games industry. But in that decade sabbatical, the industry changed a lot. It seems a lot of those lessons he did not pick up on. I'm about to get to the money, but the money only makes sense with this, the sheer ambition. Because you see, the unique funding model removes something that usually enforces discipline. Just look at the progress they've made. If you compare to 2015 trailers, you can see massive improvements in almost every aspect of the game. I mean, in particular, they've got a cool new custom solution that allows the game to cluster points of interest on a planet and allows for multiple biomes to blend together for people. They talked about the 1.0 version of the Persistent Universe. That's basically the MMO with its end game content, its player organizations, confirmation of the five star systems it would ship with. And and if you want to hear about insurance and taxation in the persistent universe, that's part of a big speech at CitizenCon. And if you're somebody like me, that's great. You almost want that second life as some sort of space cowboy. But the reality is it's overshot almost every single self-set deadline. You've heard some of why from Insider Gaming today. Others include how they handle FPS literally rather than use the industry standard for first and third person cameras. How scope has exploded. And it's the ambition, scope creep, combined with management failures, a lack of discipline, and the wrong kind of pressure. And that's where money enters the picture. This chart is Star Citizen's revenue. You can see from 2014 to 2018 there is limited growth, but then it exploded. The line went up. And some of that is what we could call business model innovations. But a lot of it is playability, especially things like persistence in the universe. You can log in and do some mining, do some missions, PvP, exploring, all sorts of things, actually. There's now persistence in what you own, where things are placed, there's progression. And with all of that, pledge revenue surging from 37 million to 114 million by 2022 is no surprise. But then, from 2022 to 2023, it was 117 million. That is a $3 million increase. That's a small increase. And if you look at the 2024 numbers, they do appear to be rather flat, if even a little bit down. 
Now, if you're like Chris Roberts and you're prone to scope creep and missed deadlines, one thing that will keep you on track is clear consequences, say a publisher having a deadline. And so here, money is both a blessing and a curse. It enables the best and worst tendencies of the visionary. Where sure, you may blow past your deadlines and actually piss people off, but where a publisher would pull the plug, they had ever-increasing revenue. And in fairness to them, much of that revenue is based on the actual fruits of their labor. They were just a little bit late. And so in this, we see the single most extreme version of both the pros and the cons of crowdfunding in gaming. It cuts both ways. Star Citizen is as stunning and ambitious as it is late. And for the people who are running it, who are all too aware of their massive financial burn rate, I think that money cannot be counted on forever. Because if 2021 to 2022 is a nice growth, but then 23 to 24 is uh, actually flat or maybe a loss, then you may start to think, oh dear, this thing has peaked and it's going to go down. And if that's what you fear, laying off 100 to 150 people sure does make sense. Hence, of course, Squadron 42. It's a standalone single-player game that could actually balloon. The problem with the Persistent Universe is it's hard to communicate to people what it is. They think it might be an alpha or a beta, they don't know if it's got progression, they don't really know how it works, and why would you invest your time into an MMO-like experience that's on a test server? That just makes no sense to people. But Squadron 42? That is a full game experience. People can buy it, download it, play it, have their mind blown, and in doing so, learn most of the skills that they would need to navigate the persistent universe and become a source of recurring revenue. That, in my opinion, is their gambit here. 18 Days of Crunch is nothing compared to 14 years of development, but the perfect demo, the demo that proves the haters wrong and says that the game is real, well, that is going to be worth something a lot more to them. You can only tell skeptics so much. Seeing is believing, and live crashes aside, that demo looks outstanding. And it likely looks outstanding because they felt they had no other option. With revenue potentially on the downslide and releases a little bit off, they need a big event. They need fresh blood because they don't earn money from regular video game selling. They earn money by backers, by selling spaceships. But you've got a problem. If your community is stagnant, who are you going to sell spaceships to once all of your current spaceship fans have bought their fill of spaceships? They need more people, and that's why they were willing to damage one of the foundations of their business to make this demo happen. It could be special. I hope it is special. It is a game that I want to play, a vision that I hope is real but it's not one that you should pre-order on a whim. And it makes me wonder, whose whales spend more money? The Star Citizen whales or the League of Legends whales, especially with their hot new gacha system, which you can learn about in the next video.